Good evening and a very warm welcome to this QM conversation on remembering Bangladesh, a conversation on the war of independence. I'm Dr. Ashwin Devasundaram, senior lecturer in world cinema here at Queen Mary University. So this year marks the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh's war of independence. And the raison d'etre of this event is to commemorate this momentous milestone. This is also the auspicious occasion of the Bengali New Year, Pohela Boishak. So Shubo Nobo Barsho, Happy New Year to you all. We have a stellar and eminent panel of speakers this evening, including Asma Khan, chef and owner of Darjeeling Express restaurant and the star of Netflix's Emmy nominated Chef's Table. Asma will discuss how food can keep memories alive. Uh, Dr. Clelia Kalini, research associate with the Migrant Memory and Postcolonial Imagination Research Project at Loughborough University, who will speak about the ways in which memories of the war circulate within migrant communities. Shomi Das, a Kathak dancer, who will share with us a specially commissioned work in response to the anniversary, and Dr. Shahidul Alam, named one of Time Magazine's Persons of the Year in 2018, and whose photography has captured major events in contemporary Bangladeshi history. We'd like to keep this conversation as interactive with the audience as possible, so please do add any questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen at any point during the conversation. So in terms of con commemorating the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh's independence, the objective is to have an energizing and dynamic discussion on how arts and cultural practice can help us remember. Our specific focus relates to how eclectic practices of cookery, film, dance and photography in particular can kindle memories of independence movements and keep them alive. How arts and culture can serve as an interpretive bridge across the past, the present and future to enable us to contextualize and contemporize these important memories. The 1971 Liberation War was a monumental moment in the realization of a long-standing dream of an independent Bangladesh. It was a time of trauma, separation, grief and anxiety, but also a moment of hope, dreams and aspirations and the irrepressible optimism that accompanies the creation of a new nation. Bangladesh is a vibrant tapestry of history, culture and society that has its own nuances, textures and particularities. But it's important to highlight the intertwining of Bangladesh's evolutionary story with that of its regional neighbors, India and Pakistan. And therefore the saga of Bangladesh's liberation is also a South Asian story intersecting with rupturing events such as the partition and going back to British colonialism and empire. In stepping back and gazing 50 years down the line at multiple threads in the tapestry of Bangladesh's evolution, memory is a pivotal factor in reimagining re the nation. So alongside uh, political and social struggles, Arts and culture are indispensable elements in conjuring memories and perspectives and viewpoints on themes of freedom and independence. So in the fraught times we live in, it's also really important to ask critical questions about the safeguarding and the sustaining of hard-won freedoms and civil liberties, freedoms to express dissenting views and speak truth to echelons of power to challenge religious and political fundamentalism, intolerance, discrimination, and to promote social justice and equality. So to unpack these diverse themes, 
I'd now like to welcome our panelists and start with Asma Khan. So welcome, Asma. Um, Bangla cuisine is invariably kind of clubbed with or subsumed by the overarching category of Indian food. But Bangla food has its own unique uh, identity, its own layers, textures, and regional specificities. So a visit to Whitechapel will uncover the aromas of shatkora curries and singaras and so on. And I can attest to hidden gems such as the biryani house whose lamb curry is beyond sublime. So can you unpack for us what culinary uniqueness and food specificity means to the idea of freedom and forging a distinctive Bangla and British Bangla cultural identity? So any thoughts on that would be brilliant. It's, I, I feel very humble to be uh, in, on the panel with such eminent people who are so qualified to talk about uh, something as significant as uh, Bangladesh's uh, liberation. I am, I come from a bloodline which has been partitioned too many times. I was obviously not there when my family was partitioned in 47, but I remember the broken hearts and, and the trauma. I was very young when the family decided to partition itself in 71. So I come from my family's, my grandfather's from Jalpaiguri, but my one part of my family comes from Faridpur, originally from Baghdad. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting because my ancestor came to teach Jahangir uh, at the court uh, uh, how to, to write Persian uh, and decided then, you know, their ancestors settled down in Faridpur. And I am Bengali in so many different shades. And then people ask me about the food and I stop because first I need to separate what people often don't know if you have not been to Calcutta and you haven't eaten in old Dhaka and is that there is no Bengali food in some kind of unique generic way that people think that there is an Indian food. There is a, you know, there's a West Bengali, East Bengali, but there's also a Mughlai Bengali food the Rizala and the Kormas, the Biryani. And then you look at, you know, the Chapli Kabab, the Bakhar Khani uh, in Dhaka, you know, it is very, very layered. Bengal is fascinating because we were like a sponge. We've had so many influences, you know, from the paneer, our, our desserts, all the different, it's the footprints of all the people who passed by our land and left these imprints on our, our, our soil, but also on our food. But there are things that are very painful, which, I recently you know, wrote something on, which is the use of poppy seeds. And I remember my mother always telling me, I'll never use poppy seeds in my chicken chow. She said it is, you know, it came from the blood of farmers. It was this thing. And when I was very young, I used to think, you know, what a silly thing, what a pretty thing, little, little white things. But in Bengal, we have a complex story, you know, of why poppy seed was used, you know, this oppression, the kind of subjugation of the farmers that led to, you know, starvation and, Bengali housewives finding this waste product in some ways to cook food. It is complex. And, you know, and then again, you know, when I look back and I think in some ways we are the richest nation. And I say that in Bengal is the food capital of the subcontinent. There is no place where you will get an entire opportunity in a short walk down old Dhaka or Calcutta where you can actually taste history. You taste the layers of history that make Bengal. And it is a huge, actually the greatest benefit. I was born there because I cook, you know, I cook Bengali food, I serve Nira Amish. It is really ironic because in my kind of uh, tasting menu, my 95 pound tasting menu, which I decided I was gonna charge that because I was tired of the racism where there's no, absolutely no credit and no honor given to our food. You know, you can have Japanese cuisine, Korean cuisine, you know, French cuisine and charge 95 pounds for a seven course meal. No one serving Bengali food would do that. And I did it in Covent Garden in this place. And I did, of course, you know, have chicken chop and I had biryani, you know, and then I had, you know, duchi aludam. And everybody who left, I asked them, what was your best dish? They said the duchi aludam. And this is the thing that, you know, Bengal has the nuance, the lightness of flavors and spices of Bengal. You will never forget. There is no cuisine like this. 
it is a subtlety that flows through the food, you know, a bit like the rivers of Bengal. This is what they're famous for. And I think that, you know, we have not presented our cuisine in the best way. We have not had people talking about Bengali food and not making the distinctions. I don't see myself different from a West Bengali, East Bengali, whether I'm Muslim or what my heritage is. I see myself as generically a Bengali when it comes to food. And But I still want to talk about the differences. And it is complicated. I mean, I'm going to be very sure because I know lots of people are here and they have far more interesting things to say. But it is also complicated in this country by the fact that initially when they came in in the 60s, Sileti's masked their ethnicity. They masked the origin of where they were coming from. They produced a cuisine that doesn't really exist. They recreated what they thought was Indian cuisine. And I never criticized them for that. I know a lot of Indian chefs like to. They came into a country with racism. Absolutely, they could not get any money. No one wanted to rent a house to someone who looked like them. They are giants. They set up a business. They created a way of creating wealth for their entire family. I don't look down on the curry houses. I do salam when I pass one. And I do. Because I am standing on their shoulders. I am in Netflix because of the curry houses. The Bangladeshis who came in, who built the curry houses, they changed the palate of a nation. And they are never credited. I am very upset when I hear people talking about the inferior quality of food, the fake food. Why don't you talk about the racism they face, the fact that they built an empire of restaurants and the next generation of people who've actually come on, the Bangladeshi community, have gone on to become professionals. It was, the, they were fueled by the food. However inaccurate, accurate, I won't judge that. I'm just proud of the fact that food was used to create a community and bring them forward. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that textured insight into uh, Bengali cuisine. I, I have another question, Asma, if you don't mind. Your restaurant, uh, Darjeeling Express, is named after an Indian train which you associate with fond childhood memories. So could yes. you tell us a bit more about your own memories of food and the culinary arts and what this means to you in terms of independence? The thing is for us, independence is, is also, I, it is very sad, but in my family, independence and partition of families is joined. So yes, it is independence and liberation for others, but it was for us partition. In my grandfather's house, seven brothers stood together in one line and their father said, Four will stay in India and three will go to the newly created Bangladesh. And they had to step forward, those that were leaving. That night, three brothers left. This is how my family got partitioned. They partitioned the families this way. My father's in, a, in, a, in from Aligarh. One brother got up and said, I'm going to Pakistan. There's an empty chair in my house, which no one sits on because that was his chair. And no one will sit on it. Every wedding, that chair is there. So... It is painful. And I think that, you know, food has, you know, and my, my mother-in-law was telling me that, you know, she can never eat duck and rice together, you know, duck egg and rice, because that's all she got to eat in Chittagong. They had a pond. She boiled the water in the 71 war. She, was, she boiled the water from the pond. They got the eggs from the duck. Then the Pakistani army would keep coming and raiding and taking all their food. They would hide the eggs and they would hide the rice. After 71, she says, I can never eat that combination again. She says, because it is almost sacred. She says, that feeling that I had, I was so grateful to God that we had this food that I can't create now that I have so much food. I will never make it again. So I think it is very difficult, you know, for me, the emotions are actually of sense of loss. I know that liberation is something that you celebrate, but I celebrate the splitting up of families because, you know, we never ate again the same. Those seven brothers met, but met on a holiday. That night where the, my family was partitioned because they thought, you know, let's let them go to this new country. Let's let them go and feel as Bengalis that they will actually be part of this new nation. We never recovered in some ways. But to kind of make it up, this family does meet a lot. But in my father's family, we never met my uncle again who went to Karachi. So it's it's... It's painful because we no longer can eat those same meals because there are too many tears and too many wounds. And I, have, I remember my mother weeping when her cousins left in 71. 
And you know, they were just crossing the border. But a lot of food was never remade again. The favorite food of those sons who left was never cooked again. This is something that you don't hear a lot of people talking about, but I'm a family that has been partitioned so many times. We never cooked that food again. We could not. Because the fact that they had left, they came back as guests. They were not ours. They had gone away. Thank you very much, Asma, for sharing those very powerful stories. Uh, can we now turn to uh, Clelia? Clelia, you've been doing a lot of research in the arena of um, memory and you know, monumental events like the partition and the 1971 Liberation War as well. And I understand you'd like to share a clip from your film uh, that is um, part of that project. So I'm wondering if we can watch that uh, film clip first and then we could contextualize it once we've uh, watched the film. Can we watch, uh, see that clip, please? Is no sound? I don't think we have audio on the clip. One minute, I'm just gonna try again. I was born in Bangladesh, um, just, after, just before the War of Independence. So I was actually registered. My birth, you know, like we now have, the, the, this is a really interesting story about my birth certificate. So my birth certificate, the serial number is 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 something like five zero. So I was like the 50th child to be registered in the new state of Bangladesh. Yeah, when they when Bangladesh government formed in 1971. So um, I was registered. I was born in 1970. Um, I grew up in a tiny little village just on the outskirts of Silet, which is in the northeast of Bangladesh. Um, and I stayed there till I was five years old. My dad, he was in, um, he came here in 1962. Then that time was a Pakistan. Then when they, my dad and my uncle and all the stuff, then my dad always said, when they liberation, like the, uh, the freedom fight start, they used to work here and they used to hand over the half of the wage to the liberation fund. Well, my father, he talked about the Liberation War. He said around the Liberation War, he was actually a student. So he was very passionate about, about Bangladesh being the only country fighting for its language. So he, you know, my father can really speak, very, he's very well spoken in Bengali. He's a freedom fighter. So he would go, he'd take us to Bangladesh every year. And when every time we went, he, the way he was respected, they'd have all these honor, you know, special days where he'd go and he'd speak about his journey and stuff like that. And he did talk to us about when we were young, he'd tell us little stories, not too much because we were too little to understand it all back then. But I really appreciate it now, learning more as I've grown up to know that, you know, he fought for the language, for its independence. He was actually, he told us stories about how he got shot and how the bullet missed his leg, how he traveled to India to train up so he can fight to support, you know, Bangladesh and get its independence. My father didn't talk about Bangladesh that much because he traveled quite a lot throughout the 60s and, and the 70s, but my mother talked a lot about Bangladesh and she talked a lot about the um, 1971 liberation because her fa her brother was killed, um, I think he was in the army and he was killed uh, during that movement. Um, she also told us about how the army had come into her area and her village and during that time it was quite difficult for them and she said literally the rags that they used to um, clean the floor with they would wear those rags so they they could give the impression that they were really poor and you know so they wouldn't be attacked by these uh, soldiers from West Pakistan. We'd gone back for a family holiday to Bangladesh it was the last big holiday to Bangladesh before I started school so my parents were very aware that they might not be able to go back as often. One morning I woke up and um, my parents were sort of bundling a lot of our clothes and possessions into uh, bedspreads and the bed covers. 
And I was like, what's happening? What's happening? And they were going, uh, we, we've got to leave. Uh, Pakistan is invading. Because even though Bangladesh was East Pakistan, and at the time we were uh, classified as Pakistanis, um, my parents would always call it Bangladesh. Desh. Um, so they were saying, you know, the Pakistani army's coming, it's, it's uh, invading Bangladesh. I didn't really understand. I, I, I got the idea that we had to run away from bad people. So they, they packed a lot of our stuff, our clothes and everything, in two big bundles. Um, and I was going, can I take these books we've bought? And they're going, choose one book, choose one book. <laughs> so I chose one book, I think, maybe two, and they got packed into the bundle. And then we started to leave my grandfather's house. And instead of going out the front muted sorry that was muted there uh, those are really powerful testimonies illustrating the persistence and the importance of memories in reappraising and contextualizing for the present uh, the liberation struggle of 1971 so can you tell us about the project and its links to documenting people's histories and personal memories yes thanks uh, so basically, this project, this, this film was an output of a collaboration that we run with the, uh, an organization which is called Brit Bangla, which is a network of professionals uh, led by Katarin Kanam. And as part of this project, this project was called Bengali Britain, and it was uh, part of the broader migrant memory and the post colonial imagination research project. So, the migrant memory and the post colonial imagination research project focuses, investigates memories of uh, decolonization in relation to partition, independence and migration. And we especially want to, we try to understand how these uh, memories circulate within communities and how social practices of remembering decolonization inform intercommunity identity in the UK and experiences of belonging, especially in relation to Britishness. So this collaboration within MMPI was part of a project that meant to that was called Bengali Britain and it was called exploring the present through the past so we uh, with participants we've been very generous as you you know can see uh, from the film uh, we've been exploring uh, memories of migration but also family memories going back to colonial times and uh, one thing that emerges just clearly uh, is that obviously memories of 1971 are still very important uh, for people of, uh, for many people of Bangladeshi heritage living in, uh, in the UK. And they still inform uh, the experiences of many people, but also uh, they are also very much linked to 1947. So which is the reason why uh, when we deal, we explore 1947, we cannot avoid to you know, talk about 1971. And uh, because we use the different creative activities uh, uh, we do cookery classes, photographies, obviously not at the level of, you know, asthma or shizal, but we do use these creative activities to, to start to discuss memories or to engage people in conversation. And these specific films was made, uh, was a plus that we decided to do on top of the photography exhibition. And uh, I'm very grateful for the generosity of participants who share their memories with us. As you say, the testimonies really underpin the strong connection that British Bangla communities have uh, to the liberation struggle through uh, intergenerational stories and memories. Uh, however, as is the case with uh, memories of the partition in India and Pakistan, the older generation tends to be under understandably uh, reticent or reluctant to speak about these harrowing and painful and traumatizing events. So I just wondered what the experience was for the contributors, the respondents. Was it cathartic on some level, but also kind of revisiting some of these pain, painful memories? Uh, so I cannot, I cannot tell. Nobody said it was cathartic per se. But what I can say is that well, because we had a lot of group discussions also around objects, uh, textiles, uh, and uh, it's like the, during conversation and especially group conversation, kind of people feed into each other's narratives and so they help each other remember or talk about specific uh, um, events. 
when it comes to the liberation war of 1971, which is indeed a difficult, you know, it could be very difficult to remember, obviously. So we have had on certain occasions, people who were kind of reticent, maybe not that willing to discuss them. Some other people, as I said, they used the word generosity because they really shared with us. And, and, um, and I found that for some people at a certain level, it seemed like it was kind of taken for granted that the family had been fighting in the war or had been involved somehow. And so they wouldn't even tell at first. So when we started conversations around partitional colonialism, 1971, they would say, oh, you know, some people, in some occasions, I don't know, no, I don't really have, have any family memory. And then maybe we're talking about Asari or we're talking about something else and people would start discussing it. I don't know if I answered your question, did I? It did indeed, it's these hyperlinks that, you know, kind of present this very uh, kind of interweaving tapestry of stories. But what, what are your thoughts on the contemporary attitudes towards uh, liberation struggle and independence? specifically amongst, uh, uh, let's say, young British Bangladeshi uh, members of the community? Oh, this is a very interesting question that we're actually trying to deal with now because we've been working with many people, let's say, from the 30s on, and we try to get, to get more people on board. I can, what I can say, I mean, we haven't analysed our data yet, but as, just as an impression, I can see a generational difference in terms of engagement with narrative of 1971, which is also, I think, intertwined with questions of identity and the way in which people position themselves in the British context. And then it's also, I would say, connected to question of racism, maybe marginalization, and especially when it comes to um, religion. Sorry, I was trying to be quick, but I don't know if I answer your question. Indeed. Thank you, Clelia. Uh, right, okay, um, I'm just going to have to backtrack a bit because I missed out a couple of questions that uh, came through and I'm now going to pose them retrospectively to Asma. Asma, we had a question about whether poppies are still grown in Bangladesh, so I just wondered, there's a question from Jahid uh, Alam, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on poppies. And I'm sorry, I, I actually wouldn't know. I know that, you know, it is used heavily and uh, posto is used you know, a lot, but I'm, I'm not sure where it's coming from. So sadly, I can't say, and you know, I'm sure that maybe Shahidul will know better. Shahidul, would you have any comments? I think you're on mute, like I was just a moment yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have seen poppy plants. Um, whether it is the right type of poppy, I have no way of knowing. But certainly poppy is available and it's out there. But I, I think we've also had a much more relaxed attitude towards poppy. I mean, I remember in Chittagong, there were these shops that used to sell ganja. This was in the 80s and they were still legal and being sold. So perhaps it's not a big deal. Thank you. I, I hope that's an answer to the question. Uh, right. OK, um, let's... We now move to Show Me Das. Uh, welcome, Show Me, to the panel. And I understand you've got a specially commissioned piece of work that you'd like to show us, which is also uh, a film, a short film. So can we have a look at the film, please?
Such a powerful and evocative synthesis of uh, different forms of dance mm. that are declamatory, expressive, interpretive, and you have such a diverse repertoire from Indian classical forms, so Kathak and Bharatanatyam, Odissi and Monipuri, but also Bollywood, Bhangra, South Asian folk, uh, jazz and ballet. So can you tell us a bit about any specifically Bangla dance traditions and uh, storytelling and their social, historical and cultural connections in your work? Um, I mean, this piece that I commissioned, that was, that I was commissioned to do, um, obviously for me, it, um, I, I felt when I was approached that it needed to be abstract. Um, and hence the reason I, I brought in a bit of a fusion and, you know, a, a very slight contemporary um, and, you know, a bit of um, drama as well. But, I mean, going into dance, uh, yes, you mentioned quite a few um, disciplines there, but I am mainly trained in Kathak. Uh, but being born in Bangladesh and growing up in Dhaka, uh, only a, a, a a certain part of my childhood. Um, I think uh, most Bangladeshis will know that all the young children at some point of their lives, they end up going to a dance school and, and as, you know, and, and to learn songs. And the thing with, uh, when I was there anyway, Taka was that you didn't just learn Kathak and Paratnatam, you learned Kathak Paratnatam as well as folk, which is the main, uh, folk is what brings um the bengal and wh which you know which describes bengal and all it, all of its people all of its beauty and you know and i have kept that um alive all throughout so even though i have trained in um Gatak, bengali folk has always been a big part of my practice uh performance and uh, and and i carry on with it and because there is such a big Bangladeshi community, not only in England, but, you know, in Europe as well. Um, we do get a lot of um, performances where we are asked to do Bengali folk. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the visual imagery in that sequence as well, can you tell us a bit about the context and how that kind of fuses with the dance performance? Um, when I, once again, going back to when I was approached, I was given um, uh, a lot of images um, and I you know I felt there was two ways I could have gone I have grown up um, listening to my mom about the experiences that my parents had over that period um, what they had to do from go from Bangladesh to India in order to feel safe and the journey um, my mother uh, when she had my sister my sister was uh, you know she was only six months at the time um, and she she was 
fleeing from one country to another and she was stopped by the a Pakistani army and she she feared for her life and she feared for her daughter's life as well as she was with her younger sisters and she felt as if you know they they were in danger and she never thought that she will come away from that alive so I have grown up listening to that um, over and over again so when this I was approached with this my initial reaction was is that that's what I I'm going to do a piece on but then I sat down with my mom and I, and I, you know, spoke to her about it again. And I felt like, um, because obviously there's t time constraints, I felt like I wouldn't have done it justice. Um, so the other option for me was looking at the pictures, um, which is obviously very le relevant to, you know, why we're here today. Um, and I just kept looking at the pictures. I mean, I think I spent a good few days just looking at the pictures and kind of, you know, just looking at them over and over again to see how I felt and what I could bring from that. And I think one of the pictures that struck out to me, and I think the reason it struck out to me as well, is um, the picture of the women holding the gun. Um, and the thing is, when you think about war, you don't think about women um, fighting. You think about men. Sorry, just give me a second. Sure. Yep. Oh, mommy, you have to go, Bobby. Sorry, just give me one moment. Sorry. All right, whilst we wait uh, for Shoni, uh, please do feel free to add any comments, any questions in um, the Q&A section as we go along. I do apologise. My three-year-old just walked in. Um, so... Where was I? Yes. So looking at those pictures um, and yeah, the, the one that struck out to me was about the women. Um, and you always, every time you picture all these wars, I mean, I haven't been in one myself, um, but all the wars that have happened in my lifetime and I've heard of them, you always see pictures of the men being the soldiers and the men, you know, kind of defending the country. So that really struck out to me. And I just thought, you know, I need to bring that into the performance. And the other thing also, the Birongonas, you know, um, I know, I mean, the, there has been uh, some very good productions um, with regards to that part of that war, but I felt like I needed to bring that about one more time. And obviously that particular image with the woman, with the face, uh, so, sorry, with the hair over her face. Um, and I, I just, you know, I do run a project called the Recare Project and it's all about feminism and it's been going for 11 years. So I do like to bring about the feminist side of things a little bit more. So I thought this was a brilliant chance for me once again, just to bring about the feminism when it comes to Bangladeshi, you know, Bangladeshi independence war. Yeah, celebrating 50 years of it and to bring about a part which I think sometimes gets hidden as, as we talk about liberation. Many thanks, Shomi. I hope we can return to some of these points uh, of discussion when we kind of have a kind of expand this conversation. Uh, once we've heard from Dr. Shahidul Alam, who needs no introduction, but uh, welcome to the panel, uh, Shahidul. And I was just thinking, photojournalism is such a powerful tool to document events, to bear witness and to challenge oppressive systems. So Rabindranath Tagore once said, the world speaks to me in pictures, my soul responds in music. In your case, your images speak a thousand words. Could you share with us your thoughts on the act of remembering through the lens of photo documentation? And I'm aware you have several images you would like to share with us so it would be wonderful if you could guide us through uh, the montage of pictures that you have for us, if we yeah, could. Sure, uh, well, perhaps we could start with the first image in that sequence, and that's particularly relevant for me. One of, I, I will probably move away a little bit from the way the conversation has gone so far. This is not a photograph by me, it's a photograph by Penny Tweedy, uh, taken in 1971, and it relates very much to what Shomi was talking about women played a very, very important role. But I think there is something also very important that ordinary people played a very important role in this war. Today, our memory tends to be rooted 50 years back, forgetting what these people strive for. 
uh, the values, the, the egalitarian society, the fact that ordinary people would have better lives, that is something that we've forgotten. We, we remember GDP and other things, and we talk about progress, but the situation of the average person. I have no idea who this woman is, was. Uh, I'm sure she doesn't register in the list of freedom fighters, and she's never received any of those awards. But it was people like her who really gave us this independent nation. And I, I'd like to rem remind ourselves of that. Let's go on to the next picture. That's taken by Roshit Talukdar. I was not a photographer at that time, but what I started doing was to collect images of 1971 because um, really it was photographed by the greats of photography. Uh, the, pretty much the who's who of photojournalism was in Bangladesh in 1971. They photographed it, yet it was never compiled into a book or an exhibit or something like that. So many years later, I started doing that. And one image that for me is very central to that collection is this one by Roshit Talukdar, because uh, as Shumi mentioned, you know, there were the Biranganas, but also before the Pakistanis left, they slaughtered the intellectuals of my country. And this was the killing fields of Rai Bazaar where uh, Rashid Bhai took this photograph on the 17th of December, but the killings actually took place on the 14th. Uh, I show these pictures to, to set the context, but I want to move away from 71 itself because I think our memory should not be trapped in that, in that moment. I think our memory about Bangladesh over 50 years should go across 50 years and look at how the nation has unfolded. And that's what I would like to do. For me, it was very important. I mean, I, on my, my sister's first child was born on the night of the 24th of March. Uh, and they were in a clinic. We tried to get them out. We couldn't. Uh, but that night, I, I remember hearing the screams. I see that saw the fire. I and I've seen the deaths. Uh, and it is important to remember that these people could not have died for nothing. There was a cause that they were fighting for, and that's what I'd like to relate to. So let's go to the next picture, please. And I'll quickly go through a series of images. I I left Bangladesh in '72. I came back in '84. And then one of the early pictures I took was this one, which is of the migrant workers of Bangladesh. And I think it is worth remembering that while we talk about the development that this nation has made, the wealth of our nation really depends upon three groups of people, uh, the migrant workers, the garment workers, and the farmers in the field. They're the people who've really generate the, the wealth of my country. And in, and we, very rarely remember them uh, in either the awards or the discussions. We rarely give them the value that they deserve. Let's move on. Next picture, please. I'm just going to quickly skim through some of these pictures to take you through. So this is later. This is, no, the last one, we just skipped that one. Uh, the last picture with the shadows, that's Muthi Shield. Not this picture, the previous one. Yeah. Uh, so this is Mothijil on the 10th of November, 1987. If you've gone too far back, can we have picture number two, please? Uh, it's a picture of Mothijil, uh, which is the Champs Elysees of Dhaka. This is on the 10th of November, 1987. Uh, as I said, I, I left an independent country. I came back to find it was in the hands of a military general. Uh, that was never the plan, obviously. Uh, but there we were. And then the opposition actually got together uh, for the first time. They all got together and there was this siege of Dhaka City. This was the day at roughly where I'm standing when I'm taking the picture, where Nur Hussein, a young man uh, who had painted on his back, let democracy be freed, was killed that day. And democracy was such an important part. It was democracy, it was secularism, uh, it was socialism. These were values that this nation had been built on. The next one, please. Uh, uh, the next picture is in 1988. This is when there was uh, probably one of the worst floods we had in a century. Uh, and this woman in Jinjira is getting on with her life. She's 
cooking on her rooftop. I went back the next day, the water had risen another three feet. I have no idea where she was. And this began a series where I was looking at this struggle for democracy. Uh, we had the military general. Uh, while this was taking place, shortly after this flood, before the waters had dried, uh, I photographed a wedding of the daughter of a very powerful minister. This wedding, opulent wedding, was taking place when this country was reeling in floods. Let's go on, please. Next picture. Uh, this is much later, and Sriti Azad is currently living in London. She was there resisting. Uh, it was a protest outside Shohid Minar. And for me, what has become very important is the fact that ordinary people uh, played such an important role in the war itself. And since then, there has been this tradition of protest. We've, we've always uh, resisted. Uh, one of the things that I, I worry about is the fact that people who have for so long questioned uh, autocracy, questioned uh, repression, today are silent. Our artists today are silent. Uh, our architects are silent. Our intellectuals are silent. And now, while I recognize that there is fear, uh, this is not a silence we've ever had. And I wonder why that has taken place. Next picture, please. Uh, so this is uh, the election. Uh, we were actually successful. Uh, and in a, a relatively bloodless resistance, uh, a general was forced to step down. A very powerful general was forced to step down. And then this was the campaign. This is Khaled Azir, who later became prime minister. Uh, you know, we were all jubilant. We were expecting a lot to happen. We were looking forward to democracy again. Uh, you know, the media's there, there's light. It's a very joyous image. Uh, and there was an election, a reasonably fair and free election. And Khaled Zia won, she became the prime minister. Let's go to the next picture. Uh, but then I discovered that uh, just having an election, uh, we've missed out one picture perhaps, but okay, uh, I think it's okay, we, we can stay there. This is election day. And for me, it was very important. This woman in a ballot booth for me was avenging Nur Hussein's death by casting a vote. She was doing something that we desperately had longed for. We were going to have a say in the way in which our own country was being governed. The next picture, please. Um, this is the election and then Khaled Dazia gets elected. She's the prime minister, but this is Khaled Dazia uh, and Right at the back, you see a tiny image and all these hench people in front. And that sadly has become the face of our democracy. The leader has receded to the back, very little connection to the people. Uh, and what we have really are these people in the middle, the power brokers who determine our lives. Uh, and it is important to remember that an election in itself, whether it be fair or not, doesn't in itself gather democ uh, guarantee a democratic process. We do not believe in the democratic process sufficiently in the political system. None of our political parties have practiced democracy within them. Uh, it's a dynasty of some form. There's never been any shift. Uh, other voices are not heard. Uh, and that is something that percolates all the way down. That has become our system of governance. Next picture, please. So this is uh, the cyclone in 1991. Um, this was in Anwara, this little girl, uh, her home had gone, her family had gone. For me, what was very special was while I worried about what would happen to her, I soon discovered, her name was Sophia, I soon discovered that another family had taken her on. Another family, just as destitute, just as wanting, found a home for this little girl. And while we talk about development, we talk of what governments do, what NGOs do, we forget what our ordinary people do. I think the generosity of the Bangladeshi poor is something that is not uh, celebrated. And that is, I believe, what has kept this nation alive. And that is the strength of our uh, community in our country. Next picture, please. Maybe I should... Uh... 
Okay, so this is uh, a situation which I later found myself in. This is uh, a student in a prison van. Uh, our students, uh, student politics is very energetic and students have played a very important role. But what invariably happens is that the ruling party takes over the university and what are seen as opposition students are either put in jail or tortured or beaten up and you know they they have no space you know it's it's physically occupation any ruling party takes over the campus and that's how things have been this was a, a student in Jagannath Hall screaming out this was during the BNP rule and it Jagannath Hall was seen to be an army supporting uh, hall uh, and these students were being taken to jail and this is a young man screaming out for his ID card because he needs it when he uh, when he's going to be questioned. Next picture, please. I'm going to go quickly through these pictures because we don't have that much time. Uh, this is uh, a different situation. This is the Chittagong Hill Tracks, uh, which is under military occupation in Bangladesh. This too is one of the taboos today. You, you can say certain things, but you cannot critique the prime minister. You cannot critique the military. Uh, the media knows the rules. Uh, and this is the idyllic picture of the Chittagong Hill Track that is presented. Yet a nation that has fought for the right to speak its own language denies its own indigenous people the right to speak theirs. And Mujib, of course, very famous, you become Bengalis. You cannot change your ethnicity. Uh, but that was what was demanded. And of course, irrespective of what government it was, the indigenous people of the Chittagong Hill Tracks have been persecuted and uh, the CHD is still under military occupation. Uh, next picture, please. Next picture, please. The raise hand function isn't working. That's why I'm having to do this. This is a different situation. This is uh, a picture of the Naxalite movement. And I show this because uh, this woman, her name was Champa. We've gone past it. Can we go back to the last image, please? Her name is Champa. And she, she had dressed up as a young boy to join the parties because she, she wanted to be part of the resistance. And the Naxalites then talked about the liberation of the poor. And within the Naxalite movement, women had a very important role. They, they had a leadership role. They, they, they were not merely uh, second-class citizens within the warrior uh, architecture. Uh, but the party got disbanded. They were told to go back. They had burned their bridges. They had no home to go back to. So I went back to talk to many of these people. And uh, that's the story I'm trying to tell. Next picture, please, which is about the Grameen Bank. Uh, it is a woman making a wicker basket. But the way she's been able to do that. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, is uh, through microcredit. Uh, microcredit has been criticized and there are valid reasons for critiquing it. But it is also true that in when money is such an important commodity, when money lenders have uh, had so much sway, the fact that the poor had access to money made a big difference. And of course, we know about Grameen Bank and what has happened since then. But many other people have practiced microcredit and it has made a difference. The next picture, please, which is about uh, climate refugees. And that's, again, an issue that's very important to talk about. Uh, the devastation that takes place in Bangladesh, these are uh, climate refugees leaving Nijum Deep. Uh, the number of people I know, it's a riverine country. And uh, almost all the people on the coast of the river have lost their homes at some point. The river that gives them life also takes away that life. Uh, and I, I, I'm reminded of the fact that we have, as a nation, such a small ecological footprint, yet ours is the nation that will suffer the most when the sea level rises. So climate change is something I'm worth talking about. The next picture, please, which is about the garment industry. It is... Uh, after the Tazreen fashion, when a lot of people, next picture, please, uh, when uh, the garment workers in Tazreen fashion died because there was a fire and uh, they couldn't come out because the gates were locked, so they, they were burnt inside. 
and we did a protest outside the building belonging to the bill, uh, owners association, but the owners are primarily the parliamentarians. Most of the parliamentarians today in Bangladesh are owners of garment factories, so there will never be reform. Uh, they've been struggling for basic wages and things like that. And when we did this show, the government sent this armed uh, machine gun laden car to deal with some artists doing a protest. Uh, that's the heavy handedness uh, that we've begun to see. Uh, next picture, please, which is about something else which hasn't been talked about. It's called Crossfire. It's an exhibit that I did looking at extrajudicial killings, which has now become so rampant within Bangladesh. And this is an exhibit that I did looking at uh, extrajudicial killings, trying to talk about this story uh, uh, more conceptually. Uh, this is the single image within that, which refers to a body. Uh, but of course, uh, the current government was very critical of Crossfire when it was an opposition, but when it, once it came into power, decided it was quite a handy thing to have. And, the recent crossfires have gone up to an enormous level. Next image, please. Uh, this is of a resistance in Shahbag, the picture coming up. Uh, and this is uh, when the bloggers were being killed and there were protests. And we thought this would be a time when the people would come together. This would be uh, another change after 91. But it didn't happen because the government was able to manage it. They were able to infiltrate this group. Uh, and able to defuse this thing, which they have done very, very cleverly, actually. They've gone through a process of divide and rule, and uh, the surveillance that goes on in Bangladesh is so extreme, it's very difficult to put together movements today. The next image, please. We then had a small, a short period of uh, civilian military rule, the caretaker government, as we call it, which was effectively a military government, and sad to say, uh, the international community uh, was very okay with this. They knew it was a military rule government, but they uh, supported it uh, and nurtured it. Uh, and this indigenous person, uh, Pratap Jambil, was one of the many people who were tortured by the military at that time. I'm now doing a story on uh, survivors of torture. I'll come back to this. Let's move on. Another very important story to be talked about, the Rohingya which I'm coming on to next. Uh, what we look at the Rohingya situation, but we forget that uh, it has been there for a very, very long time, from the 17s onwards. And the government, which now has thankfully been welcoming to the Rohingya community, was not always doing that. And these are Rohingyas fleeing the country. Um, and I was on them with them on the boat. But I'll move on because we're running short of time. Uh, to the road safety movement, which was in August 2018. Uh, and that was when the students came together, they were protesting against uh, the killings of two students. But I don't believe it was simply the killing of two students. It was, uh, there was a pent up anger about all that was going on, all that was wrong in Bangladesh. And these students came together. And of course, the government uh, virulently attacked these students. Uh, I was taking pictures, I was doing live feeds, I gave an interview. Uh, on the 4th of August, I was attacked, my equipment was smashed, I continued live reporting. And on the 5th of August, I gave an interview to Al Jazeera. That night, they came to my flat, took me away. Uh, I was tortured that night and I spent over 107 days. Uh, my bail was refused five times. Uh, but because of a massive campaign globally and within Bangladesh, and people in Bangladesh were taking bigger risks. I, I'm out on bail now, but the case still hangs over me and I potentially face 14 years in prison. We go on to the next image because despite all this, people are protesting and the Digital Security Act, which wasn't there at this time, but came on. The next picture, please, uh, became, uh, has become such uh, a weapon that the government has been using um, to round up opposition activists, uh, dissent of any form is suppressed, people are in, in jail and killed. And of course, Mushtaq, the writer, was killed recently. Well, he died in jail. They don't admit having killed him. Kishore, the cartoonist, uh, reports uh, says he was tortured and there is evidence to say that he was tortured. But that is what's happening to Bangladesh today. So while 71 was this glorious period in our history, 
we've actually descended from that to a police state effectively. Uh, and that's where we are right now. Let's move on to the next picture. The women continue to play a very important role in the resistance. And while established artists have been quiet, while intellectuals and writers have been quiet, the women of Bangladesh have continued to protest and particularly so when it's been uh, issues of rape. We talked about Birangona, the fact that women are being raped by largely by ruling party uh, Kader today. Uh, there was a woman who was gang raped because she voted the wrong way. <coughs> so this is what Bangladeshis are protesting against today. And I'll end with one image going back to the garment workers where the next picture, please, where the garment pro uh, workers are being protesting outside the press club. And you look at the police out there. These are garment workers who want compensation. These are injured garment workers who, who've, uh, who were in Tazreen fashion, who still haven't got compens uh, the valid compensation for their losses. So you have essentially police, armed police, surrounding uh, unarmed garment workers. These are armed police who uh, shoot uh, at the moment. That is what's been happening when Modi came recently. Uh, 21 people were killed in the streets of Dhaka. Uh, now, I, I recognize that India played a very important role during liberation, but today India plays a very, very different role. It is a uh, big brother and it determines what happens in Bangladesh. And the Bangladesh government is today beholden to Indian policy. Modi came over to Bangladesh, despite what uh, the fact that the nation did not want the murder of Gujarat, the person who's actively instigated communalism in India to be coming to Bangladesh. He came because it was a publicity stunt he needed to win his own elections in West Bengal and our government was happy to accommodate. Uh, and for me, as I talk about memory, I think it is a continuous spectrum that we need to talk about. It is what has happened across these 50 years that we need to remember. And while we need to celebrate 1971, we also need to remember the values of 71 and what those people had died for. And the fact that people like these garment workers are far away from the Bangladesh that we, that we dreamed about. Thank you. very much for sharing that discursive spectrum of images and for contextualizing them for us. Uh, resonating with what you've said, we've seen the disconcerting rise of authoritarianism and demagoguery around the world, but particularly in South Asia and in India, there's been a clampdown on freedom of speech and expression, repression of students, the ongoing farmer protests and the muzzling of journalists, activists and rationalists. So in 1971, journalists played a preeminent role in kind of revealing to the world the genocide taking place on the ground in the erstwhile East Pakistan, soon to become Bangladesh. How would you frame photography as a tool in the present time to address ongoing questions of independence and freedom? Well, photographers today are the ones that the government fears the most. Uh, they are the primary witnesses. They're the ones who tell the stories. And we just did an exhibit recently about the situation of photographers during COVID and during D uh, and because of DSA. And they're the ones who've been the most uh, viciously attacked. Um, at the moment, uh, even in this recent Modi uh, visit, it was the photographers, uh, they literally went against. And the police were assisting uh, the armed goons in going against uh, the photographers. Uh, what we do not have is a proper archive. What we do not have really is, we hold an archive of 1971, but it really should belong to the government. The government should have played a role. But what has happened is every government has played a very partisan role and they've not only tried to establish a particular memory, but very consciously erased every other memory. So uh, the photographers have to do the work, but their work also needs to be preserved for future historians so it can be unpacked. History is something that 
is to be told years after the event. And unless these images are preserved for posterity, it can never happen. Uh, and today, my fear is that photographers find it extremely difficult to just do their ordinary work because they're three seen as threats by the regime, whatever regime it may be. You're muted. Sorry. I'm aware we don't have too much time um, as such for a general discussion, but uh, in the time we do have, perhaps uh, some of the other panelists can pick up on the conversations we've been having in terms of the general themes of independence, freedom, remembering, memory. And uh, there are also a few comments in the chat uh, if uh, anyone would like to pick up on those. A uh, comment from uh, Saikat Ahmad who says, uh, Shahidul Alam, you're an inspiration. Thank you for your words. We must hold our leaders to account. Otherwise, what was the struggle actually for? Which I think is quite an important point about the ongoing nature of struggles, not just in uh, Bangladesh, but uh, as we've seen, and as you mentioned, with the rise of Modi and Hindutva in India, I think these are very clear and present questions that need to be confronted. Um, any, any other comments from uh, panelists? And please do have a look at the chat and pick up on uh, any specific comments that you think. Um... I just wanted to add, I think, um, you know, um, you're absolutely right when you talk about that we should really focus on the 50 years after, you know, uh, since independence. Um, and of course, you know, we do owe a lot for, for those that have given us our independence. But um, for me, it's been fascinating to learn about um, how how you mentioned the the Birunganas are still there. I mean, there's there are still Birunganas today, um, and obviously there are women uh, that play a very big part. So I think uh, you've actually inspired me to look a little bit more into um, the the happenings of today um, rather than the happenings of you know, what I have concentrated on for, for I don't know, Begum Rakea or if, for this piece of work for 71. So I will definitely be, I think, looking to do work on um, what's um, the, the, you know, bringing about the feminism in Bangladesh today rather than so many years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Shomi. I think we have a question from Ruxana. Um, hi, yes, hello everybody. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fascinating listening to everybody and show me. Thank you for your piece. I've got a question for Asma actually, in terms of some of the work that you do with women, in terms of empowering women, and then also going over to Iraq to work with the Yazidi. How did that come about and what's the legacy of that project do you hope will happen? The it was I it was just something I realized that, you know. There is, there is something very empowering about food. That image that Shahidul showed of that woman cooking, it actually just, I, I, it made me complete, I wanted to cry because that, that dignity that she's cooking, and you can see the annihilation behind. Women have always been very powerful. They have cooked, they have healed. And I felt that, you know, in a refugee camp where there was, there is this unspoken problem, which is the girls who have come back without children. They have come back to shame. It was not their fault. They were picked up, they were imprisoned, they were enslaved. But this, the older generation in the Yazidi communities have not been embracing and accepting to the girls who've come back. And I don't wanna know where are your children? I don't wanna know what happened to you. But I felt that there is a way of using food as a tool to build your confidence, to move ahead and also financial importance. Money is very important when you know that you need to set up a new path. And, you know, it was a crazy idea to go into Iraq and set up a cafe, but it all worked out and it is still going on. And, you know, right now, of course, there's a lot of problem with COVID, so they shut it down, but they will reopen. And I think that it is very, very important. You know, food is healing. Food is also about community and spirit and about the role of women. I always say this, and you know, Shahidul's piece has really reminded me again about why I always talk about why women are always behind walls. In every home you go to, you see a woman cooking. In every kitchen, a professional kitchen, it is a man cooking. 
you know, the role of women, we have been sidelined. The moment it came upon money and responsibility, no one wanted to give us that opportunity. Can you, I, I have, you know, surprised. I am the first, you know, Bengali, you know, Indian, whatever you call it, all female run restaurant. And it has taken this long. Yet we are the ones, we are the nourishers and the healers who have fed generations, but we were never allowed to feel that we could become something. So I'm, I'm hoping to go on and I am actually hoping to go to the Rohingya camp and open uh, a very small uh, cafe there. That is my next plan. Uh, but it is important uh, to, to create spaces where food is used as a way to heal and empower women. Uh, can I respond to, I know I've taken up a lot of time, but there is an important question by Sudip Chakraborty, which I'd like to take up. Can I do that? Of course, go ahead. Yeah. He says, I see the rise of sectarian groups move are completely ignored in Shahidul's presentation and also the continuous violence on the religious minority are, uh, are also ignored. Why? And he's absolutely right. I mean, within this time frame, there, that's not the only thing. There are many other things that have been ignored. And he, he's right. There is a rise in sectarian uh, uh, religious uh, violence. But I, I think it is the autocracy and the repression that is allowing that to happen. Bangladesh has never been uh, sectarian. We've, we've always been very secular as a group, but there have been attacks against minorities and it's been instigated in many situations by the ruling elite. And we have, um, I mean, I don't have time now, but we've actually published a book on those attacks. Uh, and that too is something that is not sufficiently happening. So thank you for bringing up that point. It's a very important one, but um, only so much could have been addressed within a presentation. Thank you. Um, we have another pertinent question, I think. In the UK, what notable cultural memorials or work exists in relation to commemorating the war, I suppose? So um, does anyone have any thoughts on cultural memorialization here in the UK? Uh, uh, I mean, I can, uh, at the risk of t speaking too much, if no one else wants to speak, I'll speak, but I I'll let others speak first. I was wondering if Clelia might have any thoughts uh, on this game. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I just seem, I, I forgot something. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I think, apart from the Shahid Minar, I cannot really think of a, you know, uh, um, uh, a monument, but I know there are several cultural events that are being organized, uh, not only this year, but around, but maybe Shahid knows more than me, I don't know. Well, the real, this is the Bangladesh was... Festival. The Bangladesh festival takes place on a regular basis uh, uh, and has been very effective. It started off, I think, in short, uh, what, Spitalfields and around the, around the Tower Hamlets. Uh, I mean, Ruxana is involved in the Nozdril Centre, which does a lot of things. We've actually donated an exhibit which we had at the Autograph uh, Gallery in Rivington Place on 1971, and the entire exhibit has been lent to the Bangladesh High Commission. So within the Bangladesh High Commission, you actually have a lot of images from there, but I, I do feel a lot more needs to be done. Right, and so I've just received a little note that says, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, and all that's left for me to do is thank all of our panelists for some really inspiring presentations and perspectives. Thank you, uh, the audience for attending and for uh, your own questions and comments. Uh, many thanks. I'm just going to end with a comment that was in the chat, but I think it's quite apt. It's a quote uh, by Augusto Bold, and it says, the past recreated in the present will transform the future. So on that note, have a good evening. Take care. Thank you, everyone.